Hello, everybody. My name is Jenny Thompson. I'm the Small Acreage Outreach Coordinator for the University of Wyoming Extension. I serve the Barnards and Backyards Project, which is um, made up of several different organizations, including Extension. And our purpose is to get out practical, usable information that you can use to do various things in your lives. But today I'm going to be talking about one of the things that we often talk about, which is growing plants. In particular, I'm going to be talking about growing a few natives for, that you can use in your garden if you want. So there are lots and lots of native plants out there, native to different areas of the U.S. and abroad. Um, but I'm going to be talking about ones that, I'm going to start off the talk talking about ones that you can commonly find in nurseries and other places. And then I'm going to talk about a few that take a little more effort. They don't often appear in nurseries, but you can grow them from seed fairly well. So your first thing, question you might want to answer when you're thinking about using native plants in your garden is native to where? So all natives are, all plants are native to somewhere in the world. So how native do they need to be for you? So is it good enough if they're native to the U.S.? Is it good enough if they're native to the Western U.S., to the Rocky Mountain states? to Wyoming and the states surrounding us, just to Wyoming, just to your county, just to the exact piece of land that you live on now before it was disturbed. So you kind of want to decide where they need to be native to. And so the smaller the area is that they're native to, the less likely you may be able to find all of them in the horticultural trade. The kind of wider your net is, um, the more you'll be able to find out there. So if you can't find them, then you're going to be looking at growing them from seeds. I'm going to mainly be talking about flowers today. I'm not going to be covering the shrubs and trees and grasses so much um, since we have a limited amount of time today. And this is going to be just barely scratch the surface on native plants um, since we're short on time. So there are some things you want to think about as you get in the area of growing native plants. The first one is some don't play well with others. There's some lovely native plants out there, native flowers, that I would like to grow in my garden, but I have I have grown them in my garden, and after a while I wished I hadn't. <laughs> so it all depends what how you're growing them. So I'm usually growing my plants in beds with a lot of other plants, and so they need to like play well with each other and not overwhelm each other. And some of our native plants, if you take them out of where they grow in nature, where things can be pretty resource limited, and you put them in your garden, things are just slightly better there, and so they can really take off and spread around. So they, they vary that way. So that's just something to keep in mind. Many of our native plants uh, that are native to Wyoming are drought adapted and like full sun. So if you have a real shady yard, then your choices are going to be a little more limited on what you can grow. Some native plants will need regular water and others will not. Some of our native plants grow along rivers and streams and they're riparian plants. So they're used to a fair amount of water. A lot of our native plants are not. They grow in pretty arid areas. But almost all of them need some kind of care until they're established. So you can't usually just plonk them in the ground and water them once and think they'll live. Some might, but not very many. And many of our native plants are short-lived. So this is a kind of change in thinking when you buy a plant from the nursery and you take it home, you expect it to live for a very long time usually. And so a lot of our native plants, they have naturally short life cycles. Not all of them. Not all of the native flowers are that way, but a lot of them are. And so sometimes they'll live for like, you know, three to five years, and then they will be gone. The original plant will be gone, but oftentimes they'll put down seed and they'll have replacement plants there. So your landscape tends to change a lot over time. Plants move around. So enough on that kind of overview. Let's get into talking about the actual plants. And once again, this is just barely scraping the surface on plants. The first one I thought I'd talk about is Phlox kelsei. It's also called kelsei phlox. Um, in particular, there's one variety that's out in the horticulture trade, often in places that sell rock garden plants. It's called Lim High Purple, and it's this little guy. So this plant is native to like the northeastern portion of our state, and it also grows down south here in areas. And it's this pretty little guy. He's super short. He's only like, you know, maybe two inches tall most of the time. And so it'll bloom in late spring and early summer, and it'll just be covered with this mass of purple flowers. And the uh, painted lady butterflies, when they pass through our area in the, that time of year, they'll stop and drink on this guy. 
And so it's really a pretty plant. It forms this little mound and it'll expand and get larger over time. It seems less likely to winter burn. So if you've ever grown, uh, been gardening for a while and you've grown creeping phlox from the nursery in your garden and you're in a windy area, um, where I live, it's just quite windy. And so those poor little plants, they'll get just burned up over the winter between the combination of the wind whipping away the moisture from them and then our bright sunshine burning down on them. So this guy doesn't seem to winter burn quite as bad as those types do. And it may just be because he's so short. He stays under the snow more. So that's one of our earlier plants that bloom, Fox Kelsey. Here's one that's mainly grown for its foliage. So this one you can find in the nursery trade, it's one of the pussy toes. So this type of plant is one that grows over large portions of our state. You're out around taking a hike, uh, rounding up cows, whatever. You look down, you're very likely to see pussy toes down there on the ground. And so there's one type that, or a variety that's in the cultivation and horticulture. It's called McClintock. It's a variety and it's the one in the top right corner there. As you can see, it has low growing little tiny little gray green leaves that go across the ground. And then it has the flowers that are white. Um, they aren't particularly spectacular. If you want to, you can just mow them off with a weed eater if you don't like the look at them, because it's mainly grown for the foliage. So it's a mat former that creeps along the ground. The one at the bottom is rosy pussy toes. So here it is growing in a landscape, that McClintock's variety. It's the one in the front there, the gray green leaves and the white flowers. And it's growing with a bunch of penstemons and some other landscape plants, including iris in this particular landscape. Here it is growing between some pavers. You can see those little gray leaves and you can see why it makes a good ground cover, especially between pavers like this. The only thing is if it's in an area where the water collects, it doesn't like that and it'll tend to die out in those areas. So it likes to be well drained. So in this partic particular picture, it's with some penstemons and buckwheat and some other plants. The next plant I thought I'd talk about is called Scott Sugar Bowls. It's a clematis. And so it's an unusual clematis for most people because when we think of clematis, we think of those viney things that, you know, creep up the side of the buildings and have those huge purple flowers, often are pink. Um, this is a type of clematis that's actually a mounder. It's short, grows about a foot tall, um, just forms this kind of well-behaved mound. And it produces these bell-like purple flowers and the bumblebees will squeeze their way in there to visit them. And it's a very cool plant. It is a slow grower. It's native to the kind of the southern portion uh, of our state, creeps over the line from Colorado into kind of southeast Wyoming. And it produces these cool, um, seed heads, which I don't show on here, uh, which are neat looking, and it will reseed itself a bit. But the main thing about it is to be patient because it's a slow grower. So here it is growing in the landscape. You can see it in the middle there. It's surrounded by penstemon and iris and other plants. This is another very common plant in Wyoming. It's one of the buckwheats. Once again, if you're out and about, walking around, you look down, you're very likely to see some kind of buckwheat. A lot of them, um, this one has um, a yellow kind of chartreuse colored flowers, which then fade into this burnt orange color you can see on the bottom. That's the same plants, it's just different points in time. And you see that burnt orange color goes well with those sandstone pavers in the back. It's kind of a nice combination. A lot of the other native buckwheats in the state, you'll see them, a lot of them have white kind of pom-pom flowers that have a little bit of pink on them sometimes. So they're all over the state. It's a very nice plant, um, has nice little glossy low leaves. So that's buckwheat or sulfur flower. Here it is in the landscape. You can see it up front. It's that stuff in front that has the, the, the yellow flowers you, with a whole bunch of different other plants, including pulsatilla, some penstemons, catmint, and some veronicas. Here it is growing in another landscape. You can see it on the left-hand side there with a bunch of penstemons. And this is it in another one. And this one is growing with a bunch of firewitch fire witch pinks in the front there. That's what that is. And then the buckwheat's kind of in the middle. And then there's some yarrow. It's a variety called moonshine yarrow growing on the right. It tends to be more of a clumper and it doesn't run around like a bunch of yarrows do. So it looks very well in that setting. Here's another one that I drew in a lot because it will grow well in shade. 
So it does all right in shade, where a lot of the other plants I've been talking about, they like full sun. So if you have a shady yard, your plant choices tend to be a little more limited. So this is a heuchera or coral bells. So these grow around the west in various places and you usually find them on kind of like the north sides of slopes or on canyon walls, basically places where it's a little more shady and they maybe have access to a seep or a little bit more moisture. So a lot of our coral bells in Wyoming, they have green flowers. So they don't look like much, at least flower wise. The foliage still looks nice. And so these are a couple of eucharas that come more from the like New Mexico region because they have red flowers. So the one in the top is ruby bells, which I grew from seed. And what I wasn't expecting was that it's quite attractive to hummingbirds, which is a bit of a surprise for me. And so it's a very nice one that I have in my yard and it provides a lot of color and really brightens up the shady areas. The one in the bottom is Heuchera pachella. It's a lot shorter. It's got tiny little leaves. It only grows about oh, two inches tall or so with the leaves. Um, it is quite prolific in reseeding, which also surprised me a bit. The ruby bells, I haven't seen it reseed quite so much, um, but the other one makes a very good ground cover. So those are the coral bells. Next, I thought I'd talk about penstemons, and these are just going to be a couple. You could do a whole talk on penstemons. So we're lucky in that we are one of the big penstemon areas of the United States. So a lot of penstemons are native to our area and the surrounding states for sure. So there are a variety of forms of penstemons. They go everywhere from these tiny little things that creep along the ground on the left there, which is only like two inches tall, to the one on the right, which can get up to like four feet tall when it's blooming. So the bloom time varies depending on the species that you want to grow. And a lot of the penstemons, you can find them in the nurseries. You can also grow them from seed. So here's that picture again where I was showing the pussy toes. But you can see in the back there, there's also on the left-hand side, that's probably Rocky Mountain penstemon. And then the right, there's a pink penstemon. That's probably elfin pink. So the Rocky Mountain penstemon is that blue purple one on the left. Oh, and there's also a, another penstemon in the middle that's red. So here's a picture of the berm that's in front of the Casper Extension Office. If you're ever done Casper, swing on by. It has a lot of cool plants in it, including up front. You see those red ones? That's pine leaf penstemon. So it's a short little guy, but it's really a neat looking plant. You can see it really brightens up the landscape when it's blooming. So if you want a starter penstemon, so to speak, I often tell people to try Rocky Mountain penstemon. Super easy to grow, really adaptable. Can grow in a lot of situations. You can find it in nurseries, but you can also grow it from seed. One thing I will say about it is it's a prolific reseeder. So if you have a couple of penstemon plants, you'll soon have a bunch more if they really like the area. And so if you don't want them to spread around, it's super easy to control them. All you do is you cut off, cut off the flower heads after they're done blooming before the seed gets ripe and you've pretty much controlled it. So what is cool, I'll show you this other penstemon. So this is a penstemon that's actually more native to Colorado. We don't really have any red penstemons in Wyoming that are native to the area. But this guy I grow in my landscape, he's super cool. The hummingbirds, as you might suspect, love it. And what's neat is it'll, a lot of the penstemons will cross with each other. So a bee will visit one penstemon, then it'll visit another one and it'll cross, the genes will cross. And you'll, the seed will drop on the ground and it'll grow into new plants. And so this guy will cross with those, like those blue purple Rocky Mountain penstemons. And then you'll get these baby plants that'll be like neon pink or other shades of pink that are, it's kind of cool to watch your landscape change. Like I said, they don't live forever. So their progeny take their place over time. So here's that penstemon in a landscape with a whole herd of other plants. You can say, see, it really likes the area between the pavers where it's not mulched, it really likes to reseed there. So you can see it adds a lot of zing to a landscape. This is a prairie cone flower. It's in that sunflower family of plants. Um, you'll see it as you're, you know, going down in elevation towards like Cheyenne. You'll see it growing along the road in the summertime. It's a really pretty plant. The top one is kind of a, the yellow version and then it also has this kind of burnt orange colored version in the lower right there. And they'll cross together as well. 
So it's a really pretty plant. You get some really cool bees on it. The longhorn bees like to visit it. So they're fun to watch when they're visiting these plants. In our area, it tends to be fairly short-lived. It'll live like maybe two years, but it will reseed. And depending where it's at, if it really likes it or not, it can recede a lot or just a little. So it does have a longish bloom period, which makes it nice as well. So here it is in the landscape with some bee balm and other plants. So those are the, some of the plants that you can commonly find in nurseries. So now we're going to talk about some that are a little more challenging. Um, the horticulture industry is getting really good about bringing new plants into the hort trade that are native. And so they've been bringing more and more online as you go. But there's still some that are tough to get your hands on and that you might just want to grow from seed. It's not that hard. So one of the things about growing native plants from seed that helps is a process called cold stratification. It's super easy to do. We won't get into it in this talk because I don't have time, but we have stuff online where you can find information on how to do that. It just increases the germination rate. So this is one of the plants I wanted to talk about. It's called Pulsatia patens or pass flower. It's like the uh, state flower, I believe, of South Dakota. It's a gorgeous thing and you will see it. Um, it's one of the earliest plants to bloom. So when some of the other bulbs and stuff are blooming in the garden, this guy will be blooming as well. So it's super early. You can tell this bee is really excited about finding it because there's nothing else around in our area blooming around that time. And so this particular, there are other pulsatillas that are in the hort trade that you'll find quite a bit, but they aren't this exact species. So if you want to grow it, you might have to grow it from seed. It's not real hard. It is fairly slow grower. So you'll get this little seedling and you put it out there. And this guy is probably, oh, I'd say maybe four years old. So it'll gradually kind of form this larger and larger clump as time goes by. And it's kind of an interesting plant because it puts up its flowers first and then the foliage comes up after. So it's just a gorgeous plant and that early in the spring you're just happy to see anything blooming. So it makes you happy that way. These are its seed heads. So it has some really interesting seed heads and they will fall to the ground and they'll reseed themselves if they're in the place they like. This is a plant called Easter Daisy. It's one of the town Cindias. There are a lot of different types of town Cindias in the West. <clears throat> and this is another one that you'll see pretty broad spread across the state and in our, growing in semi-arid areas usually. It's a short little guy. So this guy's about two inches tall. He's more well known to rock gardeners because they like short little things. And so he's about two inches tall. And this clump is probably, I don't know, probably five inches across. And it blooms super early. It's in that sunflower family. You can see just by looking at it, but it's in that family. And this particular one, this year, it actually bloomed at 7,200 feet on Easter. So you can see it's pretty well named. It's an awesome plant. It's not hard to start from seed. Transplants, fine. So it's not real picky. So that's good. You do want to plant it somewhere where it's not going to be basically mugged by other larger plants ones that loom over it or could compete with it a lot. I wanted to show you this picture because it shows you what a seed head looks like. So it should remind you of dandelions a fair amount because they're in a similar family. So if you're on your land or you're on a friend's land and you see this guy catches your eye and you see it sticking the seed up, you can grab that little puff ball of seed before it blows away, which often happens, and grow some new plants from it. So it's not hard. This is a plant called gay feather. There are gay feathers, they're also called blazing stars, they have several different names, that are in the nursery trade. But a lot of them are from places that are wetter than us, so some of the plain state, they get more precipitation. This guy is native to our state. It's Leatris punctata. And so that's why I grew it, is it's one of the more drought resistant ones. Um, you can see it on the right in my garden. It's a gorgeous plant, it blooms later in the season, Butterflies and bees will be all over it. And it will likely reseed. I haven't seen it recede a lot in my garden, but I've seen it in nature. So along, it grows in the Albany County area. It grows around a lot of the state, but I've seen really large areas of it in the foothills and the bighorns. So there's quite a bit of it there. You can see on the left-hand side, that's one of them just growing alongside this, uh, along the side of the road blooming. It's easy to start from seed, 
um, has a fairly long kind of tap root, so you get it transplanted fairly early. This is a plant called bloodroot, and it's a fantastic, gorgeous little plant. Um, those blossoms are probably about an inch and a half wide. They're super neat when they, you see them blooming. Um, they are a, a succulent type leaf. And so what happens is it will put up its leaves, it will bloom like this, and then it'll produce seed, and then those leaves will shrivel away to nothing. And so you won't have any idea that it's there anymore. So if you're a gardener and you're digging up things a lot, you probably want to mark where, it, where it's at. Otherwise, you find yourself accidentally digging it up to plant some bulbs or do something else like that. It's surprisingly easy to start from seed. Um, sometimes it's a little hard to find a seed in the trade, but it's a gorgeous little plant native to our state. So that was just, like I said, barely scratching the surface with native plants. Um, we have a ton more information of a ton more plants that are on our website. If you just go to the barnyardsandbackyards.com or Google it, it does want to open that up. Um, we'll just stop sharing after I get through these couple more slides and show you. So this is one of our publications that you'll find on that website. It's called Plants of Altitude. It covers a lot of different native plants that are native to Wyoming and the surrounding states. So you might find that of interest. There also are books out there that are very useful references for growing native plants, including the one on the right, which is written by folks from our state. And it's like an encyclopedia. You can, hopefully you can either find it and buy it or find it in your local library. And it's like an encyclopedia, like I said, you can look it up, a whole bunch of different plants. The one on the left is an awesome book and it's one of my favorites. Um, it includes a ton of different plants in it from a guy who has a lot of knowledge about growing them. The only thing is it does not have a lot of pictures to go, it doesn't have a picture to go with each plant and a lot of the names are in scientific language. So if you don't like that, you, if you're a beginning gardener, you may find that annoying. So let me get out of this and pull up the website. So here you can see our website. And if you scroll down, you see all the bunch of different topics that I cover on the website, which is quite broad. If you click on native plants, I'll take you to our native plants page. And the first portion of it covers identification. So a lot of, if you're down in the southern part of the state and you're visiting or something, they have a lot of picture guides you can use to dif identify different plants and keys to conifers around the state. And then we also have a bunch of websites connected that are really cool resources for those of you that are interested in native plants. But if you go down a little farther, we have a section on growing native plants. That includes a bunch of different um, articles, including ones on cold stratification, like I talked about. And here you'll find our Plants with Altitude publication that I mentioned earlier. So those are some resources to help you along your journey of getting to know native plants. So I hope you found this information useful today. Um, the joys of growing native plants in your la landscape are many, um, along with being well adapted to our area. They, it's also just cool to have them so close by to you all through the growing season. You get to watch them and observe them as they go through their life cycle, including watching a lot of the native pollinators that come to visit them. So it can be a really wonderful experience to grow them. So I hope this helped you get to know our native plants a little better and perhaps you'll saw one that you'll be inspired to grow in your landscape. Have a good day.